Hello, I'm Michael Hackney, and in this tutorial, I'm going to show you one of the, the more powerful tools that I use to help diagnose auto calibration issues with Delta printers. So let's jump in. Um, let's get started by clicking on the Settings tab in the Duet Web Control interface, and then we'll go up here to the System Editor. And here's a list of all of the system files um, that you're probably familiar with. In particular, you should be familiar with config.g, which is where all the configuration setup for your printer occurs. One you may not have paid attention to is this bed.g. Let's click on that. Bed.g is the file that gets called when you run uh, Delta Auto Calibration. And it basically tells the printer all of the probe points, that's this list down here, each of these is one of the probe points, it's X and it's Y coordinates, and some information about probing. Um, it does the, the set of probes, and then finally at the end of that, it um, initiates whatever calibration um, you have instructed it to do with this uh, S parameter. And S, actually, there's a, a little reference uh, sheet up here, that tells you what it is. We'll talk about S-1 here in a minute because that's basically the heart of this technique. But um, so for instance, if you do a zero factor um, calibration, uh, basically it's just going to probe that number of points. If you do three factor calibration, it's going to probe the and calibrate the three homing switches. So those are the switches at the top of your, of your uh, Delta Towers um, typically. Four-factor calibration does the homing switches and then adds in the important delta radius calibration. Six-factor calibration does the three homing switches. It does the delta radius and then it does the X and Y tower position offsets. And it's six-factor calibration that we typically do by default on, on, on our delta printers. There's also a seven-factor calibration which does everything that six does, but it adds in calibrating uh, your diagonal rod length. Don't use that one for now. I'm going to talk about this in more detail uh, in, a, in a video or, and or a blog post. Um, one of the challenges with having auto calibrate do your diagonal rods is the dimensional accuracy of your parts is partially dictated by diagonal rod length. So if your rods are, say, 100 millimeters long, but they calibrate to be 102 millimeters, you're going to find that your parts are too small. The X and the Y dimensions are going to be smaller than you would expect. Um, and so you, you, there's a, you, know, you have to use a more traditional um, print apart, measure it, and uh, calibrate based on that. I've written about this in the blog. Um, you can go take a look, and I'll do something more in depth uh, as a video later. So for now, stay away from the seven-factor auto calibration. Six-factor is perfect. Um, it's fast and um, gets the job done. Um, as I mentioned down here, there are um, probe points um, which tell the printer you know, where to start probing and then it works its way through the list of the points. They have to be numbered starting with P0 through however many you know, points you have. So in this case I'm probing 13 points, uh, so P0 through P12. There are going to be six points around the outer perimeter, the, the largest diameter of my, uh, of my print bed. Then there are going to be six points um, on an inner uh, diameter, sort of in the mid between the center and the outer perimeter. And then at the very end, there's a probe point right smack dab in the middle. And, you know, typically this is, you know, by convention, you don't have to do it this way, but by convention, you usually do that center one last. And uh, that's where you um, invoke the, uh, the calibration by including the S parameter and the number of factors that you want to calibrate. Um, a couple of things on the way I like to set up my bed.g on all of my Delta printers. Um, and again, this is personal preference. Your printer may be set up different. You may have other preferences. <clears throat> but I like to start probing at the base of the X tower. That's the tower to the left in the front when you're facing the printer. And then I probe counterclockwise. So now I go between the X and the Y towers. So that's right smack dab in the middle, right at the front of the printer as I'm facing it. Then we do the Y tower, <coughs> pardon me, and then work our way around to the Z tower, and then finally uh, do the point between the Z and the X tower, and then we move into the inner uh, radius where we start over again with the X tower. I do it this way for consistency, so when I look at the output of, um, of this technique that I'm going to show you, 
I will always know uh, which probe point is associated with the um, with the height error that I'm I'm looking at in the console when I do this. Um, you'll see that here in a minute, so don't fret too much about it yet. But just having a consistent, uh, you know, probing arrangement um, makes it a little bit easier to analyze the data when you're done. So the the heart of this technique basically is to change this S six or six factor calibration to minus one and minus one basically will perform the probing it'll look just like it's doing an auto calibration but it's not going to adjust anything all it's going to do is print out a line in your console that is the height error at each of the probe points and what you can do is run uh, we're going to create a macro you can run that macro three times is typically what I do run it three times and compare the variation uh, across the three runs at each point. And that's where you're going to see issues, um, you know, potential issues with, uh, with calibration problems that you're having on your delta. Uh, you can see things like FSR is binding, you can see variability in probing, um, uh, you know, a whole slew of different things you can, you can get out of this if you pay attention. So what we need to do, oh, one last thing. Um, so you can learn more about the G30 command and uh, the calibration factors by going to the RepRap wiki and it's at reprap.org slash wiki slash G code, G dash code. And this is really the, um, uh, you know, sort of the, um, the place you go if you want to learn about any of the, uh, the printer G codes. And here I'm already at the G30 command and it'll give you all the information you need. And here's a section about RepRap wiki, I'm uh, sorry, RepRap firmware and what that S parameter is. On Delta printers, the factors um, that are viable are um, four, three, four, six, and seven. And like I said, we normally do six factor calibration. So that just gives you a little bit of background about the G30 parameter. The other thing is you don't have to generate all of these points manually. David Crocker has created this nice little um, web tool to, uh, to generate the points for you. So if I want to do um, six points around the outer perimeter and then six points in a diameter halfway in and do six ca factor calibration, let's say I have a 300 millimeter diameter bed like on um, a uh, Rostock Max, uh, an Artemis, or a um, Ultabots D300. I can set that to 150 millimeters for my radius. Um, typically, your nozzle is going to be in the middle, so that would be zero, zero. Um, you can do a home at start. I usually do. Um, you know, depending on your probe, you may have to deploy and retract the probe. I use FSRs on most of my printers. I do have um, a, a Duet 3D strain gauge. Um, which is another contact type of probe. Um, I also have IR uh, uh, probe and um, working on getting a, um, a piezo uh, probe installed on another printer as soon as that comes in. So you may have to select that depending on the, on the type of probe that you have. Um, and then you just simply click generate bed.g and there you go. Those are all of the points um, that you need cut and paste in here, starting with that G28 right there, all the way through. And as you'll see, it's put in my S6 factor down here. Um, and you can create a new set of, um, of probe points for you. Now, I don't recall if this puts it in the order that I normally use, or if it starts at, the, yeah, it looks like it starts at the Z tower. And it looks like it goes clockwise around. So. You know, you could live with that, um, just, you know, you'll have to reorient your mind uh, to your data. Um, I normally just uh, uh, do these pro points uh, in a spreadsheet that I have, and it calculates them in the order that I want. So anyway, that's pro points. What we're going to do is make a copy of this entire file. So I've made my copy. I'm going to say cancel. Now I'm going to go up to the macros um, folder. And actually, this is what my macros directory normally looks like. And you'll notice that I have a folder set up for different things. I have one for probing. Um, so I'm going to click on that because what I want to do is create a new macro. And I'll put it in the probing folder because that's where I normally keep it. And I'm going to go over here and say make new macro. And I'm going to call it calibration results. Calibration results. Say OK. 
And now I'm going to paste that um, bed.g file in here. And the only thing I'm going to do is change that S6 to S minus 1. And since we're not auto calibrating uh, six factors, we're actually just doing a probe test. Um, I'll delete that comment so it doesn't confuse anyone. So I've changed it to S minus 1, and I'm going to click Save Changes. So now I've got a new macro called Calibration Results here ready to go. So we're ready to actually do some testing. And before we do that, I'll do a little segue. You notice that I've got my printer heated up, both the hot end and the bed. Um, you know, there are two trains of thoughts about whether things should be heated or not when you do uh, calibration or any type of probing. Um, I think everyone agrees that you should have your bed heated to the um, appropriate you know, temperature that you're going to be printing on. Uh, beds have a lot of surface area and they do tend to change dimensions um, sometimes pretty significantly as they warm up. So to get the best results you do want to have your bed up to normal operating temperature. Uh, where the, I guess, where the, the two camps come in is whether you should have your hot end heated up or not. I'm in the camp of yes, heat up the hot end, have it ready to go. Um, it, it, you know, one of the the, um, the reasons people don't like that is because you do get uh, or can get uh, filament drooling out of the nozzle, and um, you know the claim is is that that can alter your calibration results, and I agree with that. However, it's really simple to mitigate that problem. Um, what I do is right before I hit calibration or right before I'm going to uh, run this calibration results macro. I turn around to my printer and I swipe the nozzle with a little piece of leather to get any drool off of it. And then I run calibration. Now, it could be that while it's calibrating, you could get a little bit of drool and you'll see little zip marks on your bed at each of the probe locations. Um, so the second uh, uh, complaint about doing it this way is that those little zip marks are actually throwing off your 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 probe trigger point a, a bit, and that results in um, you know not a good calibration. In practice, for contact type of probes where this would be an issue, I don't see that as an issue. Um, and I've done a lot of testing and studying this phenomenon. There's so little plastic, and it's so hot. You know, 195 degrees here. Um, on this hot end that and there's so much you know I'll call it pressure when the nozzle hits the bed it just kind of squishes out of the way and you know maybe it's a hundredth or two hundredth of a millimeter thick um, which is not going to cause any kind of a problem I I have um, like I said studied this and I do really critical Z height on some of my parts um, with the open mesh weaving, if you see my fly fishing reels, if that Z height is not dead on, uh, you'll see the part will look horrible. And I've been calibrating this way for, well, since the beginning of, um, of RepRap firmware DC42 auto calibration history, and I've never had a problem. However, if it is a problem, you can do a trick that I used to use, which is take a long straight edge, and I've got a spatula that's about one inch wide and about eight inches long or six inches long and right after it calibrates because um, I do a calibration at the start of every print it's in my g-code header so right after it calibrates um, I quickly swipe the entire bed just kind of like in a, in a Z like Zorro uh, to remove all of those little zits and that will um, you know remove them before you do a print uh, however, more recently, I haven't even bothered to do that uh, because it turns out that those little zits, when you print over them, they melt into the first layer and you don't even see them. I've looked for these under magnification and I've explicitly printed on top of the zits so I know where to look for them and you just don't see them. So those zits don't really cause a problem with um, you know your surface finish on your first layer if you're concerned about aesthetics and I, you know, I can assert that um, what little bit they might be contributing to the uh, uh, the Z height is insignificant and won't cause a problem for you at all. Um, so, but it's up to you. Uh, one thing I will say is if you do not heat your hot end up, make sure that you have removed all traces of cold filament out of the tip because that can affect uh, your, your, your Z uh, equals zero point.
Um, it won't affect, probably won't affect the overall calibration quality because it's a consistent uh, amount that would be applied to each probe point, but it can in fact affect your Z equals zero. Okay, enough said. Let's go ahead and do some tests and I'll show you what this is all about. I'm gonna wipe that nozzle with my piece of leather like I mentioned. I'm gonna hit uh, calibration results. It's gonna run the macro. And while it's doing this, let's go look at the G-code console. I'm gonna clear the log here because we don't need to see all of that. Um, so it's actually now probing at the base of the X tower. Now between the X and the Y at the front, very front of the printer. Now at the Y tower. Now between the Y and the Z. Now at the Z tower. And now between the Z and the X. And now it's going to move into that inner radius. It's probing at the X position. Now between X and Y. Now at the Y. Now between Y and Z. Now at Z. You can probably hear it in the background, between Z and X. Now it's going to come into the middle, and it's going to probe right at the center, and it's going to spit out its results. Okay, so here's what you get. And so, as I mentioned, because I always probe from the X and go counterclockwise, I now know that this height is for the probe point at the outer perimeter, right at the base of my X tower. This one is halfway between the X and the Y tower. This one is at the Y tower. This is between the Y and the Z. This is between the, I'm sorry, this is the Z. This is between the Z and the X. This one is now moving into the inner radius at the X tower. X to Y, right at the Y. Y to Z, Z, oops, Z, uh, between the Z and X on that inner radius. And then finally, this is right at the center. And then it calculates your mean and it calculates your deviation from mean, which in this case is 0.027. And that would have been a very good calibration. Okay, so interesting information, but by itself, not, uh, not that useful. Uh, well, it is somewhat useful, but not as useful as it's gonna be if we run it three times. So let's run it again. Um, I'm not gonna give you the point by point description this time around. We're just gonna let it do its calibration. You can hear it homing now behind me. Now it's gonna come down and do the calibration. Um, uh, the probing, I mean, and, and print as calibration results. And then we'll do it a third time, and then we'll compare. While it's doing this, one thing you can do, um, looking at just one, uh, one run, is, okay, so these six points, one, two, three, four, five, six, are the outer perimeter. You, you want to see if there's a pattern of, um, of error, if you will. Sometimes you'll see what we call, or some of us call the taco effect, where right at the base it might be high, and then between, um, between the towers, at the base of a tower it'll be high, between towers it'll go low, and, and frequently that'll even drop down to be a negative offset, then it'll go high again, then low, then high, then low, and then high kind of like a, a wavy pattern, a taco pattern. Um, and we have some theories about why that occurs and, and you know, there are ways that you can, you can um, um, fix that problem. It seems to be an issue related to flexibility with FSRs. It also might be related to the verticalness, if you will, of the, um, of the arms on the probe point nearest a tower. Um, there's a couple of different you know, things that we've been trying to get a handle on why that occurs. But sometimes you'll see it and there's way, ways to correct for it. Okay, so we've uh, we've done the second one. I'll go ahead and kick off the uh, the third run. And we'll come back here and look at the console. And now we can start to take a look at what's going on. So what I want to do, so this point and this point right here are the points right at the base of the X tower on the, on the largest diameter. And we see there is a little bit of variability. It's what, about point, uh, uh, point 0.3, uh, I'm sorry, about point two, point zero two two uh, millimeters. And that's not a lot, but you know, it's, it's something to think about. Here we've got point zero one five. Um, since this is a minus and that's a plus, that's about point zero one five. You know, so we're, we're wanting to make sure that the variability here is small and consistent. Um, and these look pretty small and they look, um, you know, reasonably consistent. Okay. Okay, so it's done the third. So 
I've got my three runs. The first thing I'm going to do when I've got my data is to look at the means. And I see that the means are pretty consistent. I mean, this is a really small number, um, just by way of comparison. Let's Google 0 0.012 millimeter to inches, just so you can see how small this number is. That is rounded up to five. That is five ten thousandths of an inch. So that difference is trivial. And I mean, you can't even uh, do machining with reasonable, you know, CNC equipment at that level of precision. It takes really high end equipment to hold ten thousandths of an inch precision. Um, the second thing I look at is a deviation from the mean. And again, we see that the deviation from the mean is, is quite tight. Um, so not a problem there. So having determined that, now I'm going to look at the data itself looking for issues. And so, like I said, first point uh, right at the base of the tower. There's my first run. There's my second run. There's my third run. That's, yeah, yeah even for this printer, that is a little unusual. I would have expected this um, to be more consistent and tighter. I wouldn't have expected to see that large of an outlier. But again, you know, from 0.029, let's round that up to 0.03 to 0.07. 0.03 to 0.07 is 0.04. Let's see how big that error is. So, whoops, 0.04 millimeters. You know, again, that's only two hundredths of an inch. Not, you know, not a huge amount. Um, and 0.04, if you're running uh, 0.2 millimeter uh, thick layers, it's about 20% of your layer height. Um, so you would still be able to get a good uh, first layer, um, but again, it is a little more variable than I variation that I see on this printer. The second point over, yeah, you know, there does seem to be a pattern. This last probing run is a little bit higher. Uh, that could be because I didn't clean off the bed or the nozzle when I did these two uh, these two probes. So actually, this might be an example of, um, yeah, clean off your bed, clean off the nozzle before uh, running the probing because uh, those little zip marks could be accumulating. And actually, I'm turning around here, and indeed, I can feel them and see them on my bed. So I'm not going to fret too much about this. I would uh, rerun these, clean off the nozzle, clean off the bed between each run, and I would expect these to be a little bit closer. But for our purposes, you can see what I'm doing. I'm looking at comparing the values um, at each probe position across the three runs. And what you're really looking for are patterns. So patterns within a run like that waffle pattern I mentioned, high, low, high, low, high, low. Or you're looking for just wild variation. Sometimes a point will trigger. Uh, sometimes it, it won't trigger. It'll be much, much higher. And that's indicative of um, binding, um, particularly with FSR systems, uh, depending on how you have your FSRs arranged, if they're in a plunger type of device, or if the bed itself has uh, little hold down clamps pushed up against it to keep it from moving around, uh, that can indeed bind if it gets a little bit of uh, filament stuck in there, or uh, the bed is shifted a little bit, one of the, uh, the FSRs may be binding a little bit more, require more pressure to trigger, and you'll see that with a much, uh, you know, with a lot of variation at that particular point in that particular run. So those kinds of inconsistencies from run to run is what you're going to see when you do this kind of a, a test. So this point here, uh, pretty good. This one looks really good, very good, very good on that one. A little more variation than I would like on this one, but not horrible. Um, yeah, pretty good. That one's not bad. That one, yeah, a little bit more than I would have expected, but not bad. Uh, that's a big jump right there from 0.011 to 0.048, and the last two are consistent. And then finally, um, you know, this is big in the middle, but those two are uh, pretty much the same. But at the end of the day, I got good calibrations, and I would expect that when I printed, um, things would be, would be just fine. Um, this printer has never had a problem with calibrating and, and laying down a perfect first layer and you know these are the kinds of results that I get uh, for auto calibration. What you're looking for are really big differences you know particularly if you see something in the uh, in the first decimal place the tenth of a millimeter or you see anything up around 0.05 millimeter variation from you know one, one point to the next point. Those are the kinds of things that you're looking for. So just to kind of 
close things up. Let's go ahead and home so I get some space. I'm going to clean up my bed with my spatula. I'm going to swipe the nozzle with a piece of leather. I'm going to run Delta Auto Calibration and let it do an actual calibration. So while it's doing that, just to recap, make a copy of your bed.g file, create a, a macro for it. I like to call it calibration results. And then, oops, then simply change that S parameter in the last G30 line, S minus one, and that will um, probe all the points and then simply spit out the probe height offsets rather than do the calibration. It'll also show you what the results of the calibration would have been. And then using that data across you know, three runs, you can um, you know, see if there are any, any issues uh, with trigger heights at particular probe positions, uh, whether you have uh, an issue with this waffle effect that I mentioned earlier, or you know, a slew of other issues. Okay, so I've completed a six-factor calibration over 13 points. We see that our deviation before was 0.031. And uh, after 0.021, which is typically this printer calibrates right around there, that's an excellent calibration. I could print part right now and lay down a perfect, uh, a perfect first layer. Okay, so that's it for this tutorial. Hopefully that was helpful, and hopefully you'll have a new, uh, a new tool in your tool chest to help diagnose problems um, with your Delta printer.